Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Jack, much is being written and said these days about the conservation of our dwindling natural resources. We've long been a wasteful, profligate nation in the use of these natural resources. We are just beginning to realize that if we are to progress at our present rate of expansion, if we are to keep pace with the nation's growth and demands, we must make some radical changes in our way of thinking. Now here's the story of one industry, the anthracite industry. Your job is to get that story on film, and it's quite an assignment. I'm Larry Maiden Ford. I live in Joliet. Uh, I live about a mile east of here. And basically all we're doing is mining coal here, anthracite coal. It's been a tradition, it's just like in different areas you have different traditions, you know. Maybe where you come from, logging is a big thing, or maybe where you come from, uh, trucking's a big... Well, around here it's just coal, that's all we had. I let Bill up and down, I hoist him into the mine in the morning, and he gets everything ready. He'll drill the, the coal vein, he'll drill his holes, he'll load it with dynamite, he'll blast the coal out, and after he blasts it, he'll come up and have a bite to eat, and then he'll go back down in the mine and he'll load it out of a chute, and we'll hoist it up on top. Generally, we only hoist five or six buggies a day, that's all we hoist because it's a small mine. This ain't nothing like you were in before, right? so that's what I told you. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> You're at the bottom. When his brother left, Bill stayed here by himself. And I'm going to say that was probably four to five years ago that Bill's working, he's working alone for four or five years now. Bill just has it in his blood, so he stayed, you know. He's a hard worker, he's 67 years old, and to be doing what he's doing at 67, this is one of the harder mining veins in the anthracite region. I don't know if you just can get up here or not. Because it's so small, and then it lays straight. When you have the, a flat pitch vein, you just basically walk around and it's no problem getting around, but here you have a lot of crawling. And then in tight quarters, you know, some places this vein comes down to only one foot thick and he can barely slither through. Of course it ain't too bad. Hard the old man's wind on you.
I mean, I, I don't mind, you know, and I take, I have to take my time, though. I gotta do that because I've taken blood pressure pills. And I've already had it where I exerted myself, you know. Man, oh man, I didn't, I didn't know whether I was gonna keep going or not, you know. And, and uh, then I'd just stop and, you know, lay down for a little bit. And you're all right, and you, then you're good to go again. But if I take my time, then I don't get into them situations. So I, you know, there's nobody pushing me or not, and I work on my own, so. That's it. We don't look for no money. All we do is look for a little bit of help. But you don't get the help from the government. The only help you get from them is to put you out of business. And that's what they're trying to do. And if you go to the gas station to buy the gas, you'll see why. You'll see why. Now here it is, we can sell all the coal that we can get out of the ground and they're tying our hands and won't let us get it out of the ground. They want to put us out of business. They're telling you they're dangerous? Well, how come they don't make you work them according to the danger of it? Not a book? How can you open a book up and tell you what this mine, this mine wasn't built by a book. It was built by two men that came here and built it. There's no book to this mine. This mine's a mine. You can't go to a store and buy a part for this mine. It's all handmade. It would appear to me that, that the, the government is, is enforcing the laws in the effect that instead of uh, being MSHA helping the miner, they're trying to drive us out of business so that they can gain control of the coal. And the, the MSHA is sort of like a sheriff. They're, they're trying to get us off and get us out of business and get everybody out of the coal, coal business. You don't get up every day to, to, you know, to go to work and say, well, now, how can we do today, do stuff illegally to get away with t just getting by today? Dave Hibbelberger, you're at R&D Coal Company, and you're down 2,300 feet. Growing up as a boy, your dad's a coal miner, and, I mean, the first thing you want to do is go down here. So I was about eight years old the first time my dad took me down. So. Pretty scary. Uh, the ride down was, till you got, once you got down there, though, it was, it was just like walking around here. This is uh, fourth generation. All the same family? Yep. We don't employ, no, most of us, it's all family, cousins, or nephews. basically born in you to go down and to do it. A lot of people get there, they'll look, they won't even go down, you know. But it's basically born in you. It's in your blood. It would be his grandfather plus my grandfather. So you mean it's like five generations. Tell me about your family. 
Well, tell me about the Lucas family. Where should I start? <laughs> uh, my mother is one in the Lucas family. She's one of 21 children. Most of the boys were in the mining business. All the Lucas boys at one time were in the mining business. But uh, it's in our blood. The Lucas from the Lucas family. Hold it! For the, the fifth, sixth generations of it. Going for the last 150 years or better, maybe. And uh, I respect it. I respect the, my job. And my job don't respect me, but I respect my job. My job is my boss, nobody else. Yep, I'm David A. Lucas from Higgins RD1. This is D&D &D Andesite Coal Company, the School County, Poor Township. How long you been uh, coal mining? She's nine years old. My name's Ernie Lucas, and I work for D&D &D Coal Company. I'm a coal miner. I do everything there is here to get done. I'm just a worker here. OK, I'm Rick Lucas. I'm Joe Lucas. I at JRNL Coal Company. I'm uh, Darryl Lucas from D&D &D Coal Company, partners here with my brother David A. Lucas. This here is the only country in the world that you can go to jail for working for a living, for actually going to work and making a living to feed your family. We are the working poor, and there ain't too many people that want to do, be in this business and even go down inside the coal mine and work. We are the working poor. Uh, you know, I'm, the coal's moving now, and I don't think I was ever this poor in my entire life. 14 total are left, where 10, 15 years ago there were hundreds. And it's basically because of the federal government and their, their rules and regulations. 2005, we're down to 12. 12. And yet the number of orders issued this year alone is something like five times the number that were issued for all of 1995 when you had five times as many mines operating. Uh, this was one of the bigger operations in the area. And uh, according to all the new laws and regulations, uh, here it sits. Nothing left to it anymore, closed down. We're nothing to them. You know, we, we're hardcore people. I mean, we're, we, nobody, nobody, I bet you 99% of this world would not do what we're doing. They won't do it. They're afraid to do it. There's water over here then, Mark, you're gonna wash up. This is water. I wash it. Well, you, you don't wash your hands in the shower, but inside you can't do it. We're, we're a dying breed, we're like dinosaurs, and uh, if the people don't follow after, we can't make money in the business the way you should make money. Who the hell wants to be in the business? It should be dinosaurs. You gotta put your lights away then, boys. You better put them on charge so we have them for more. I'm gonna put this in my truck so I don't forget. I believe that this country should declare a Marshall Plan to create uh, energy independence and clean coal technology and this technology taking waste coal and coal itself, transforming it into non-sulfur diesel fuel, which is much better for the environment. President Bush is a step closer to getting the energy bill he's been asking for since he took office. The provision is passed. The Senate overwhelmingly approved a $16 billion energy bill designed to ease America's reliance on foreign oil. This new technology is zero emission technology. We effectively take what we need from this coal and leave all of the sulfur, all of the mercury, all of the arsenic behind, and we create this clean fuel.
you look at a picture of uh, the battlefield of Gettysburg uh, or a lithograph of Philadelphia, you'll see something that is pretty unique if you visit it today. There's no trees. There are very few trees. You know, these were open fields. And the reason they were open fields is because everybody heated and cooked um, and built everything out of wood. 90% of our virgin timber is already gone. Yeah, the first energy crisis in the United States was actually a shortage of firewood. And it was before there was the United States. Uh, the people in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston had cut down so many trees around the city that it was increasingly difficult to transport firewood from long distances into the city. Price of firewood skyrocketed. Same old, same old. All we do is change the words from firewood to coal to oil. I mean, we do it over and over and over again in our society. Twelve of us. Brothers and sisters? Yep, there's eight boys and four girls. The mine we're working right now provides for this fam these right here. This is like maybe about half of my family. And the one mine we work now feeds all these kids. And... So every time that you guys get closed down or there's any kind of... This is what it affects, you know. They all go home with the Payless Week. You better not forget that. Tom. I won't forget it, Chief. You better not. I won't. I will cry. No, you won't. I'll need that for Monday, bud. Out of the eight brothers, these are the last remaining partners. This is Jim, Tom, Bob, that's me, and the other one behind me is Al. I got that there, and I got Shingera, our last name, across my shoulders in the back. Yeah, well, it's like, like I said, he was, they were pulled, he was pulled out. He's still in school. He's just here for the summer. I was 15 when I quit, and it's not like they made you. You had your choice, you know what I mean? I wanted to work, make money, come up and be a coal miner like this. My pop, my dad, and his dad. And <laughs> really can't, I can't remember the first time I was down, but I can remember kicking rock for 50 bucks a week out there and the tip was throwing it off. And I'll be <laughs> And there's probably about 35 of us on the homestead. How big is that? The homestead. It's about 143 acres, I think. We all took bushland, so the farmland is still is what was tillable when my dad bought it. Bought it in 1955, I think, or 56. This is a lump of coal my uncle had made for my father when he died. He had it, got it off a Reading Anthracite, weighs nine ton. He had it engraved, we brought it in on a rollback, got a crane and sat it in place. My mother and father are both buried here. He's wiring the leads to set the shots off. How many holes are going off, Wes? There's 10. About 40 holes. No, 
Yeah, yell fire. Fire! One of them holes you didn't need, Chief. That was the heavens. Nature began making anthracite 250 million years ago. This is when the story of anthracite began. Lush forests of tree ferns and of a variety of other plants, flooded with sunshine and drenched with rain, died and were replaced in rapid succession by other forests. The weight of this sand and mud on top of the peat pressed the peat into a harder material called lignite or brown coal. Millions of years went by. More and more weight and pressure were put upon the lignite. This weight, aided perhaps by the resulting heat, pressed the soft black rock into what we call bituminous or soft coal. When it was squeezed for another few million years, it became hard coal, or anthracite, the highest grade of solid fuel, product of a multi-million year aging process. As many as 14 layers of this type carbon deposit have been found. To our knowledge, this unusual phenomenon occurred in this country, principally in this 484 square mile area of northeastern Pennsylvania, which we now call the anthracite region. Anthracite from cities and towns with such colorful American names as Pottsville, Shenandoah, and Shikshini, Shimokan, Hazleton, Nanticoke, and Mahanoy City. As I stood on the bank of the Susquehanna, I marveled that many of these cities are literally built on anthracite. Progressive cities and towns that today are attracting new and diversified industries to the hard coal region. A lot of people talk about uh, the importance of anthracite to the Industrial Revolution. Well, the Industrial Revolution really was as a result of the need to replace wood. And the, the construction of the mines and the building of the equipment and building the canals and building the railroads, was, it was, was the Industrial Revolution. And this region had about 95% of the anthracite coal that you could find in, in, in the United States. There were early discoveries of it, and then during the 19th century, just vast increases in the production of this coal. What you do get in the region uh, is this successive waves of immigration. First people from uh, surrounding areas of the region, and then from Europe, uh, from Ireland, from Wales, from England, southern Italy, and uh, from Central Europe. You've got about 180,000 anthracite miners producing over 100 million tons of coal. And most of north e the northeast of the United States, which was really the heart of urbanization, the heart of industrial America, just relied, just ter relied tremendously on this coal. And as of the 1920s, you begin to see a, a downturn in uh, production and ultimately employment. First, you are getting inroads from other fossil fuels that are cheaper to produce and are cheaper for consumers. Bituminous coal, uh, soft bituminous coal, had always been a rival to anthracite. It's a, you know, a soft coal that doesn't burn as efficiently and certainly burns, it doesn't burn as cleanly, but it is a coal that's much cheaper to excavate. Uh, it's closer to the surface and it can be dug out and dug out with machinery. So by the 1920s, you have vast mechanization in bituminous coal, lowering the price of production and to the consumer. You do also get a series of strikes in the 1920s, which um, uh, pulls anthracite off of the market. Um, and that's when you begin to see the first shifts, particularly in home heating, where you begin in the Northeast for people beginning to buy furnaces that will be heated through uh, oil or natural gas. After World War II, when 
uh, oil began to displace uh, anthracite as the primary heat source for uh, home heating, uh, the, the regional mines began to close down. From the new St. Nicholas Breaker, Reading Anthracite brings to Pottsville, to Pennsylvania, and to the nation the latest improvement in quality controlled coal cleaning. Reading Anthracite. And there was massive unemployment in that part of Schuylkill County. Um, and so the workers there, they really could not organize to spread the work. There was no work to spread. So they resorted to an old tradition of going to mine themselves. And it was called bootlegging. It, that has a, a pejorative term. Um, you know, it implies stealing, you know. But that was not how it was envisioned there. This was seen as a just activity for people's survival, and they often called it independent mining rather than uh, bootlegging. And then there was no more big mines, so then they come back and they put little shakers at their mines, and they screen the coal to sell it. You know, it was tough when they did that. Well, they were out of jobs. They had to do something to survive. The miners went out and stole the coal. That's what they, why they were called bootleggers. They stole the coal. And, and from that, I mean, a major industry d developed. It, it just, independent became big. I had a bootlegger in my life. Bootlegger, we stood us sun up and we work the sun down. Sometimes we see daylight. We're in the dark all the time. That's carbon light, fuels and caps, a whole kind of bootle. We work like animals. But we worked, and I'm still here, I'm living proof of it, though. Hard work does not hurt nobody, but do it properly. Well, the only thing that I can say is, I was born and raised on this mountain, and I was trained by one of the best yeah, bootleggers, if you want to call them bootleggers, my dad Sitting in the business. The HBO I started in 1970 in a little bootleg mine, and I went from there down to Porter Tunnel, which is a mile, approximately a mile west of here. And I worked there for five years, and I went into business on my own. You get into mining, and they say it gets in your blood, and I believe it, because uh, you get a love for it. And as far as the dangers are concerned, dangers lie all around. But. Uh, as far as that goes, you just keep going. And a family affair, it had to be a family affair because sometimes the money just wasn't there. And you had to work a delicate situation to keep going. I do vision do my do not that law. Pennsylvania is my home. Pennsylvania is where I was born. Well, I'm P.A. Dutch and I ain't learned much. But I'm willing to
My family has been employed in the coal business for many generations. My brother is a coal miner. My father and every one of his four brothers are coal miners. His father and his father before that were coal miners. My name's Randy Rothable. I own the RSW Drift Mine. It's right outside of Pottsville. My name is Cindy Rothamal. Uh, I've been working in the mining industry since 1981. My boy, my nephew, and my neighbor work here. Mike Rothermel, uh, president of Summit Anthracite. We're a small deep mining uh, company in, uh, located in Good Spring, Pennsylvania. I'm Ken Rothamel. I come from family of coal miners, and I've been mining now for a little bit better than 30 years. Well, the, the gist of the anthracite region here is that it, they are primarily small mines. Uh, myself, it's myself and one partner. My wife runs a scale. Uh, if uh, the employees that we have, if they're not related to us, they're our neighbors. Uh, small, compact units. Uh, we've known everybody for years. They've known us for years. This is where we do our canning. We grow all our own vegetables and raise our meat, and we come in here and do our canning for the winter. That's our canning room back in there where it has all the preserves and everything. You sure? So, sure. These are our potatoes, they're all homegrown. These are my canning shelves. Pickles, relishes, tomato sauce. Stock up for the winter. Our electricity goes off here about five times a year. <laughs> so we have to be stocked up and there's times that once in March 93 we were stuck for five days without, that we couldn't get out, so we have to food. So you're very self-sufficient people. Extremely self-sufficient. And that's but that, that's the way we were all raised. It's uh, generations of hand-me-downs as far as ideas and, and thoughts and this is, this is who we are. The only time they get a day off is when they're in court fighting Emshaw over one violation or another. They used to be coal miners. Ultimately, they become electricians, paramedics, and now today, even lawyers. And it's a sad, sad commentary on all they actually want to do is go out there, dig for coal. During the blizzard of 1995, my mother picked over 10 ton of rock out of the coal in just one day. My father worked for three months with a cast on his leg, much to his doctor's dismay. They have little choice. There's no one to do the work for them, and they don't get federal aid like the farmers, so they just keep working. As a teenager, I watched my parents suffer through the agony of learning about mining accidents that had claimed two men in which they had both worked with and socialized with. As a young woman, I felt the pride of learning my brother had saved the lives of two miners by holding up a wall of coal, about to fall and crash them with his back, until they had crawled to safety. As a grandchild who feels the sorrow of never knowing my grandfather who was lost in a mining accident before I was ever born. So you will forgive me for the grudge I hold against an agency that is intent on destroying all these miners have suffered for. Pennsylvania anthracite mining is not only a job to these people, it is a way of life. The only life they know. A life that is threatened every time Emshaw writes another citation or demands compliance with a law that has no bearing on the industry. In 1889, the state of Pennsylvania enacted the first coal mine laws in the country. They enacted two coal mine laws, the bituminous coal mine law and the anthracite coal mine law. When you're mining bituminous coal, this is your coal vein. When you're mining anthracite coal, this is your coal vein. In 1968, I believe it was, there was a disaster in Farmington, West Virginia. And that uh, forced the federal government to enact health and safety laws. 
What they did in effect was took Pennsylvania's bituminous coal mine law and enforced it over the whole country and over all of the coal mines, and we were forced in with those. Now we're told the law is the law. It doesn't matter if the mine is laying this way or this way. You enforce it. You know, mining is mining. And they said that, mining is mining. Well, it, it isn't. Anthracite is totally unique, and the law should be different for our type of mining. And they said, by George, you will obey this book till we're done. And this is what is going to knock everybody out of the ballgame. I believe it's the interpretation of this book. You know, we're not, we're not here to be in business to be out of compliance. It's to our benefit, as since we are small family mines, that we run safe mines. The small person has to have the coal on the ground to make his paycheck. And he has to go through all kinds of elaborate systems to get that coal from point A to point B because large industry has to do that because they're involving, you know, 100 people or something like that. And injuries, you know, because of people not paying attention or everything. At a big industry, yes. At a small industry, we're three, four men working together. They know what they're doing. If not, there's one watching each other. You know, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a family when you're on the ground. And now this book is coming back to us. Yeah, from down south, not, a different way to mine. That's what I'm What I'm telling you. It don't. It don't pertain to our mines. No. It don't pertain to our mines. Two different operations. Everything's 100% major different to what it is. The coal's different. The working conditions are different. Down there, they mine thousands of tons a day. But it's all machine work. We're still here to pick and shovel, the sledgehammer, air drills, and chisel hammer, and jackhammer, whatever, and maybe a conveyor once in a while, or a motor car, you know, it is there. But the rest is all the way it was 100 years ago. There ain't much difference in it. You know what I mean? I'd gotten asked by a newspaper reporter if I felt unsafe because of the mine accident in West Virginia. And I sort of I was sort of taken aback by that because it doesn't because they had an accident down there doesn't mean that we're not working in a safe manner, that we don't do everything we possibly can to make ourselves safe. Anytime you work like we work, you have to have people you can trust and people you can count on. And if you don't, you're gonna you're not gonna last. And typically, family and friends are the people you count on. We don't cut corners when when you're you're talking about very serious, dangerous work. And there's nothing safer, I don't think, than what we do, just because of the way we conduct things. Yellow light went on. He's ready to fire. Fire! Okay. Now, if you want to come in here, I'll show you sort of thicker in here. You know, walk into here a minute, then. The the problem that we have is dealing with the federal government. And there's a big difference between the federal government and the state government. The state law was designed for us. Uh, if we need help, if we need, have a, a problem that, you know, we need what's called technical assistance, we will ask the state for help, and they will freely give us help. If we ask the federal government for help, the help they give us is they'll come in and they'll find the living tar out of us. 
I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. We were, I mean, we were on an even keel. Things were going well. Everybody was, was, was profiting until 2000, 2001. Actually, 2001. Jack Kuzar and Bill Spavari. I would say the worst has been in the past three, four years, since, since Kuzar's in. I'd say another two years, she won't have any money. Now, and this, the, this new guy that got up in uh, <coughs> Wilkes Barre, what's his name? Jack Kuzar and uh, Bill Safari, and now you have Les Coleman out here in the Pottsville office. He's, he's a rotten son of a bitch there. He's working with them guys up there. That he, guy and he in never, Wilkes Barre, he's... And he never seen the inside of Coleman. He just has no heart. <laughs> he's from the South Coal region, and he just don't Me. have a heart. The changeover from being award-winning minds to being uh, put on the, the dirty dozen list uh, is one of the real puzzlements of this whole situation because nothing has changed. It's not like their safety programs disappeared overnight. It's not that they changed their training. It's not that the management changed. It's by and large the same workers who were there then are there now. And what I think is more significant, they're continuing their, pract their safe records. They're not having injuries. They're not having illnesses. What's changed is the enforcement posture of the agency. We used to get awards off the feds, but now we haven't, they don't even do that. They used to come, if you had a good safety record and, and had, like we had, I'll get, she has it here, but it has the man hours and the coal that was produced, for no accidents, and they used to hand these out and instead of coming and trying to burn these mines and put them out of business, this is what they did years ago, you know, they, and this would be in the newspaper. We have newspaper clippings of us getting this award from, from Mesha, the mine office. And this was for the, the number one slope, the Rothmore Coal Company number one slope. It was uh, presented to us in July 9th, 1996, and uh, we receive no rewards like this anymore. All we get is citations, even though we've been accident-free at our mines since the last time we had an, had an accident was 1981. This is it. Start driving the car. Train a monkey how to do this in two and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Our minds around here are family operates, family and friends. We know each other. And I, I would not have my son go in a dangerous situation and something that I wouldn't do and have him get killed. You know what I'm saying? We don't need M. Shaw to enforce those kind of laws on us. I'm going to keep my friends and family safe. When I say they approach it with malice, some of the things that they do, I mean, they, they just came after David A. and threatened him with IRS. They have a vendetta against David A. He was basically one of the first to speak out. Put the IRS on me and they had the DP to state after me, the whole crack of boodle. Nothing to do with coal mine, nothing to do with safety whatsoever, it's a goddamn shame. It seems they feel that he is one that they could force out of business 
so they make a target out of them and they bombard them with inspections and citations and whatnot. Seven months, they have 58 inspectors here. 58 inspectors here. And now since August 11th, this new guy come in here and he wrote me more citations in one day than I had in the last 10 years, probably. 32 violations in one day he wrote up. I don't know where Amshaw's jurisdiction begins or where it stops, but I'm sure it is not to analyze a business tax return and threaten him with one item that's claimed on that tax return. And like I said, it's all nick nitpicking bullshit. Really? Now, if he wants to fight me, I'm a fighting son of a bitch. Don't screw with me, my mind. Don't, don't screw my family. Take food in my, 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 my family's mouth. Fight me, son of a bitch. Don't, don't, don't beat around the bush. I mean, I'm struggling and, and ain't making nothing. I'm on, I'm on the food stamp program right now, and I'm, I was ashamed of it. Now, this is the second time I went back home since, since last year, and uh, this is the reason. Every time they come in, they give me these closure order signs. I have personally reviewed hundreds of citations that have been issued to these mines. And, you know, by and large, uh, I know the word nitpicking tends to be overused when we're talking about this, but that's what it is. Things that would be written up as a non-significant and substantial violation, if any, at other mines are being written up as reckless disregard and unwarrantable failure, you know, the highest level of negligence citations and orders for the purpose of being able to shut these folks down over fairly minute things or conditions that were accepted for years. I got one uh, last last week for an inadequate toilet paper, and I had no idea what the hell that even means, inadequate toilet paper. I guess I gotta do it for the dictionary. There's so many, so many things now that are just harassment type, uh, a porta potty at the mine uh, where there's two men working, you know, uh, it's just, it's amazing. It, it, it's just amazing the things that are being, you know, driven into the inspectors now that you have to issue or you're going to be, you know, labeled as insubordinate and could be harassed. There was a situation that occurred in this area around the Christmas holidays where MSHA came in, hit a lot of these mines hard and hit uh, at least one of the mines that I, I represent with imminent danger orders and shut them down. It was right at the, the, the beginning of the uh, anthracite heating season when they would have maximum sales of the anthracite in their community. To come in and do that to a, to a mine at Christmas just shows their attitude or their lack of compassion or their lack of feeling. This year for Christmas, I go into another of my kids. And that makes me feel that fucking cheap to government rules and regulations that don't exist at these, uh, at these mines. That's sad, and I'll tell you what, somebody's got to pay for it. And I don't believe in lawyers. Somebody's got to pay for it. I've noticed in the past they've ordered me to go out and shut mines down the week of Christmas. So I, that, I, I felt like that was their way of Vengeance. Merry Christmas! Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> Somebody's got to be at the head of it. I mean, are they making all their all these decisions to shut the mines down and the, the harasses? Are those two guys making these decisions? Because there's somebody above them making the decisions. This is what we're trying to figure out. Is it uh, United Mine Workers? I don't know why they want to do it. They, everybody keeps kind of pointing the finger to the United Mine Workers. Of course, we're independent miners. We have nothing to do with that organization. These guys are in bed with the UMW. There's absolutely no two ways about it. Exactly. The last five inspectors that were hired were all UMW people. Today, I believe only about 15% of miners are represented by unions. Uh, and because these are by and large family members, they felt no need to pay dues to a union. They didn't feel they were being oppressed by their companies. And so they rejected that. And it's payback time now. If you allow a few small operators to lower safety standards, that that spreads. I understand that they're, they're concerned about somebody's taking food off their table. But if we allow them an exception, what happens to the people that they drive out of business because they're allowed to avoid the law? 
It's a memo that, that goes from, from Terry Bentley to Kuz, our district manager, Coles Mine Safety and Health District 1, and attached to this memo are comments from the United Mine Workers why RSMW should not receive a petition for modification. Now, these men, no representatives of the United Mine Workers have ever been in the RSMW mine. They don't know what the individual circumstances are, why we applied for this t petition, why we feel the law does not um, apply to us, so why, why the United Mine Workers would have, uh, have an objection, I have no idea, unless, you know, they're just have a vendetta against us, too. Why did the UMW call the ATF, or call the MSHA office, and the MSHA office called the ATF, and said that the underground well, operators in Pennsylvania down. aren't safeguarding their explosives? And all of a sudden, a guy comes to work on a Monday morning, and at both of his minds, there's a federal inspector, there's an ATF guy, two ATF guys, and a state policeman. What are we, freaking criminals? Well, I don't think they're being treated like criminals. I think they're being treated like people who have to obey the law. But and they're not really breaking any laws, you know? I yes, mean, they are. the way they've been doing it for the past 100, 150 years. See, that's where you're wrong. They are breaking the law. Otherwise, they wouldn't be getting written up. They have thought for a long time that the, the coal mine health and safety laws don't apply to them. Now you have several inspectors that are saying, listen, you have to do this. This is what's written in the law. They are breaking the law. You get to a point when these small mines owe enough MSHA penalties that they can no longer pay them, that the government can come down and seize these properties um, or force them in order to salvage a minimal amount of value, force them to put the companies on the block. One large producer could then come in and gobble up these remaining dozen mines and they would own all of those valuable reserves. And we're talking, you know, millions of tons of anthracite. Once they control that, they will also control the price of it. And uh, they'll certainly have an economic advantage uh, in both the national and the global marketplace. Uh, they can more effectively market this to other parts of the country than these small operators can. Uh, you know, and they may well, you know, have convinced the federal government that it's in their best interest from an energy perspective to take these resources from the hands of these small companies and put them in the hands or the stewardship of these larger companies that can more effectively extract and market them. Um, I could see where you know a well-paid lobbyist could make that argument. Once they put the small mine out of the small miner out of business, they'll come in and they'll strip strip our areas out, you know, and uh, roads can be moved. They moved a lot of roads already in time to come, you know. They can move the roads, the highways, any goddamn thing. Money talks, shit walks. Bottom line. This back here is, is a, today's modern coal mining. It's called mountaintop removal coal mining. And what they do, the coal companies in the state of West Virginia use as much as three million pounds of blasting material in one day of operation. And uh, what they do is they blast the mountain apart and, and haul off everything but the coal. There's 120,000 coal miners in the state of West Virginia, and now there's less than 12,000. And it, you know, this is something that I've watched happen uh, through my lifetime. My grandfather was a coal miner. Uh, my father was a coal miner, and I have two brothers that work as coal miners, and there's a number of aunts, uncles, and cousins that, that work in coal mining. I've seen people replaced with equipment. The people in the communities have left. Uh, the community's been devastated by flooding and blasting and dusting, and, and the people have naturally left. The coal companies and the energy industry in the state of West Virginia wants to depopulate these hills and these hollows. And, and you know, this in some cases, this is people that's, the property goes back 10 generations. 
I've sat here on my front porch and watched hundreds of millions of dollars in coal roll by my house. And nothing's ever come back to these communities. These people have always been hard workers. They've always given a, an honest effort and they've never received anything back. Nothing can live, nothing, nothing can live. But on this side of the gate on my, my land, you see, you come here and, and you see trees and, you, and, and in the summertime and wintertime even you see birds. On the mountaintop removal site, you see nothing. There used to be a waterfall down there, beautiful waterfall like you'd see on TV. You'd go down there, we'd take our clothes down and wash them down there and play in the waterfall and play in the, in the pond there. Not only the waterfall is gone, but the pond's gone. I don't know if there's any other mountain range in the world that has lost 500,000 acres of mountains and 1,000 miles of streams. I mean, it's ridiculous. They move that whole mountain. In three months, the coal that came out of that mountain has been burned, and the mountain's gone. And we ain't got nothing else. And, and those mountains will never, ever support hardwood forests again. The oaks and the hickories will never grow there again. They're destroying it for money, and that is all it is. They'll claim jobs. Well, they're not, they're not creating jobs. They never were creating jobs. They could probably mine underground for another 150 years before they'd have to even resort to mountaintop removal. But the problem is it's too expensive. They have to hire too many people. And so they close a mine down, an underground mine that used to hire 300 people, and they open a strip mine over here or mountaintop removal, and you look out there and you see eight or 10 people working. The way our country uses energy, 50% uh, of our electric power comes from coal-based systems. About 30% of all the energy we use in this country um, is derived from imported sources such as oil. We have probably reached the peak of world oil production. And we have to say probably because you can't know you're at the peak until you've passed it. But the other thing, of course, is the security issue. Uh, our current oil imports probably now represent about 60% of American oil consumption. That's almost double the percentage that it was at the time of the oil embargo in the 70s. It was 80 years ago that a couple of German scientists, Fischer and Tropes, perfected a process to convert coal directly to diesel and gasoline, aviation fuel. It was the Germans during World War II that were converting coal to diesel. That's how they ran their military. And the South Africans, 30 years ago, embarked on a plan to become self-sufficient in their own diesel, gasoline, and aviation fuel with South African coal. We're going to take a closer look tonight at the new appeal of coal. For years, it was the world's fuel of choice. Today, oil has that title. But as the price of oil rises, coal could be making a comeback. The industry now says it's the perfect time to perfect the technique that can turn coal into liquid gold. Uh, this uh, home canning project is basically the uh, first batch of Penn State coal-based jet fuel involving uh, Pennsylvania bituminous coal as one of the feedstocks. John Rich, whose Pennsylvania mine has been in the family for three generations, thinks coal can end America's dependence on foreign oil. In four months, he will break ground on a plant to convert his coal into fuel. We talked to the legislature about the concept of taking waste coal, converting it into hydrogen and carbon monoxide synthesis gas through the entrained flow gasifier, and then putting that in contact with a, a catalyst like they do in South Africa and, and producing a liquid transportation fuel. Pennsylvania exports $30 billion a year abroad to buy energy. Think of what the impact of that would be if we could buy that $30 billion worth in Pennsylvania. The United States has been called the Saudi Arabia of coal. You know, we're concerned that oil prices are high right now, oil reserves may be running out, natural gas supplies are tight, natural gas prices are also rising. 
Right now we have an army over in the desert. Every day you hear that there are a bunch of kids being killed. And these are kids, 18, 19 year old kids. Their lives are just starting. There were more kids killed over there in the desert than what there have been in all the mines in the whole country in the last 30 years. This is unreal. Uh, there's more coal here in Pennsylvania than you know what this country could use in energy in the next 100 years. Why do we have to be over there? We don't need that. Fire, fire, fire! Right now there's a, a big boom for anthracite coal and when the miners finally have an opportunity to become somebody up here, they're getting stepped on by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. And the federal government's stepping on them when right now in a fuel crisis the opportunity is perfect. Now all of a sudden our own government, which a part of I work for, is helping to put them out of business. It's just a personal vendetta between the mine operators and the management. You know, uh, we'll get them. We'll put them in jail, we'll put them out of business. They can uh, initiate a criminal prosecution even in the absence of an accident, much less a fatality or an injury. They are writing so many of these in that ultra-high negligence manner that I think it's just a matter of time before the next strategy is going to be to bring a criminal prosecution down. I've been told by Mr. Spavari several times on the phone when I disagreed with him on pursuing criminal action. He always, in his own words, they are going to jail, very firm about it. They are going to jail in his investigation. In my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, it was uh, abusing their authority. You know, um, really abusing their authority. Bavari needed my testimony, according to him, to pros prosecute this lady criminally. And I, if I would have really believed, if I really thought that she sincerely, knowingly broke the law, I would have told him so, but I didn't think that to be the case, and I told him so. And he was just so gung-ho on prosecuting mine operators criminally, which meant that he was very upset with me that I wouldn't testify in court for something I didn't believe in. And I, and I still, to this day, I do it all over again. I would not, even knowing the outcome that I got fired, I'd do it all over again. You know, what are you gonna do if you see two of your neighbors being taken away in handcuffs? Aren't you gonna think maybe uh, getting a job at a, a local Walmart is a good alternative? Or going on welfare? Uh, these guys don't want to go on welfare. They are a strong people. They're proud people. They're used to doing for themselves and providing for their families. How well can you provide for your family if you're in a federal pen? Let's say they get their way. Let's say you go off in handcuffs or the violations or the fines are so much that you can't deal with it. You're like going out in handcuffs, on the casket. <laughs> and I was going to jail. Several state and federal agencies now have investigators here at the Buck Mountain Mine. They believe it may have been some kind of an explosion that killed the 42-year-old miner from Donaldson, Schuylkill County. Investigators still have a lot of questions tonight as family, friends, and fellow miners deal with so much shock and sadness. When they were doing some blasting underground, one of the miners was standing in a position where he probably shouldn't have been and there was blowout of the rock. He was hit by some of the material and was knocked down a coal chute where he suffered fatal injuries. Dale was a very accomplished mechanic, coal miner, multi-talented person, very mild-mannered, kind of a quiet guy, but took his work and his family very seriously. He was quite an experienced miner. He had worked for other mines up there in the area for years, and 
he had always been observed performing his work in a safe manner. There had not been problems with his adhering to the rules in the past. I was very saddened by the fact that he was killed in the mines. It certainly was unfortunate, and I miss Dale's presence. When there is an accident underground or when people are trapped underground, it makes a compelling story. But it's not really more dangerous than other manufacturing and industrial jobs. As to what would have caused this, was it an accident? Was it uh, a, a mistake? We don't know. And I, I wouldn't want to say that at this point. What Emsha proposed to do in terms of penalties in this case was an absolute travesty. They decided to make this the poster child for their new toy, the new flagrant penalties that only went into effect after the date of this accident. And in this case, they illegally applied the, the penalties, in my opinion. And again, this is something we'll be trying to show in court. Here you have a seven-person company, and they proposed $874,500 in penalties. I think that was a record for any MSHA case including ones that, that involved you know, a dozen fatalities on previous occasions against very large companies. They were just waiting for something to happen so that they could follow through on their longstanding threats that they were going to try to put these guys in jail. Unfortunately, this accident occurred and it gave them that opening to launch all of these false allegations and, and to go into what I consider to be malicious prosecution and abusive process. And it took its toll. For them to take the enforcement action against Stu that they did, it wasn't Stu's fault. I'm sure that the last thing on earth that Stu ever would have wanted was to have one of his friends hurt. It's un it's it's so unfortunate when you, you have an accident and someone gets hurt, and then a fatality, and it's someone that you have known all of those years and you were friends with. You feel bad enough. I can imagine how, how bad Stu felt. And then to have the weight of the world come down the way it did on them. The Seiko disaster didn't amass over three quarters of a million dollars worth of fines, and that was multi-fatalities, and the size of that operation was a giant and dwarfed the Book Mountain operation that Himmelberger was operating. It was a small mine, had a very limited amount of, of production, a very limited amount of profit, it was common knowledge on the street that Amshaw wanted to bring criminal charges and see him in jail. And this preyed a lot on Himmelberger because basically he was a very honest, straightforward, hard-working man. And that's about all I can say. And he voiced this to me maybe 15, 20 days prior to his suicide. Do I feel that Amshaw in their actions were influential in his suicide? Definitely, yes, they were. In the manner that they conducted the investigation, shutting the mine down, imposing unbelievable penalties, and threatening to put him to jail. Yes, definite yes. See, so like coal miner, Dave? I do, uh, it's interesting, you know, it's, it's not boring, that's for sure. Different, uh, there's nothing set, you know, one, every day something can be a little bit different. I don't like to be harassed every day, that's for sure, by Emshaw. Sensationalism. We're gonna get them now. We're gonna get them now. And what did Stu do? He did the final act of defiance. He was the little mouse standing in the field with the eagle coming down to devour him. 
And he said, you ain't getting me. Final act of defiance. Shut his fan off. And checked out. Basically, he had her just push the small guy out. Why? What the reason is, I don't know. <laughs> That's all red tape. What's left in it? All red tape. I got a little black heart and it's full of. Before I lose my property, lose, take a pot of paint in my house over my dead body first. No, I'm lying. Or their, their dead body first, mine last. Who in their right mind today would want to own a coal mine and be subject to this? Only the people who have done it all their lives. It's in their veins, it's in my veins. I've been a coal miner all my life. My dad was a coal miner. My grandfather was a coal miner. It, it's what I've done. And it's what the people like David A. have done. We were, we were raised in the coal business and we mine coal. And because of it, we are chastised and we're being forced out of business, put out of business. Well, Lowell, here's the story as I saw it. Jack, I wonder if you get the real significance of the story. True, our engineers and scientists have developed modern equipment that makes the burning of anthracite as convenient, as efficient, and as economical as any other heating fuel. Our strategic resources of oil and gas are limited, and we are burning them up at an alarming rate. On the other hand, we have more than 150 years' supply of anthracite. Therefore, one of the most important steps in any natural conservation program is to use this abundant fuel supply to heat the homes and buildings of our northeastern states. From Virginia to Canada, anthracite is the logical, most dependable fuel of the future.
B and B Rockridge Slope, which are the the Bender family, the first Bender family, which is Ricky Bender. Lately, life with you has been unbearable. Little Book Company, Coal Company, which is the other Bender family. All my faith in you has gone. I know it won't return. Chesnut Coal Company, which is the Shingaras. I did everything to make you happy. I could do. Tito Coal Company, which is Greg Showers. You got me hating things I used to love to do. RS and W, of course. And it won't be long. And I'll be hating. R&D Coal Company is uh, one of Stu Himmelberger's mines. Whatever happened to the love that we once knew? Joliet Coal Company, which is Bill Reiner. Was it jealousy? Did you just grow tired of having me around you? R&R, &R, which is Gary Lucas. I did everything to make you happy. S&M Coal Company, which is Daryl Caperna in Williamstown. Got me hating things I used to love to do. Two Snyder Coal Companies. Uh, Snyders have one, a mine in Higgins and one in Treverton. And I'll be hating you. d and which is David A. After the beating my heart this took it should be black and blue. Come on, Ernie! But you just won't admit that we are through. Now you got me hating things I used to love to do. And it won't be long. And I'll be hating you. It won't be long. And I'll be hating you. Sunlight is golden, at least 